Hello, this is Pastor Sam Velez, and I'm so glad that you're joining us for our service. We hope you enjoy this message today, that it blesses your life and your families. We love you. We've been in a series called Made for More, and we've been talking about what does it look like as a Christian to understand that God has created us for more. God did not put you on this earth to settle, to live for less, to just live and and survive until you die. No, God put you on this earth so that you can thrive and do something great for him while you're alive, while you're still on this earth, while you're still breathing. God created every single one of us for more. It doesn't matter whether you are 12 years old or you're 90 years old. God has created you for more. God has put a purpose on the inside of you. Your job and the platform that you are in as a place of influence that God has you in in this moment because he understands and he knows the assignment on your life that if your office would get saved, it would change the whole company. That if your teachers and your, your coworkers and your friends, if they would know Jesus, it would change the whole school. We sometimes minimize the places that God puts us. Because we don't think it's a good platform. We don't think it's big enough or it shines enough or it gets enough attention. But the place that God has put you in is a divine purpose that he has for you. It's a divine assignment. And God puts you in place through there. The only thing that me and you have to do is simply live it out. And simply walk in the calling that God has for us. And so this morning, I want to, as we close out this series, I want to, I want to teach off of this title. It doesn't fit anymore. It doesn't fit anymore. When my first daughter, Catalina, was born two years ago, I remember every, everybody would buy her clothes. Obviously, the grandparents spent thousands of dollars. I didn't have to worry about it. Clothes after clothes after clothes. Shoes. My daughter has an amazing closet. I, sometimes I feel like we need to turn her closet into a walk-in closet because it's just clothes after clothes after clothes shoes after shoes. But we quickly found out, and if you're a parent, you know this really well. What we quickly found out was that every single time we would put on her outfits and she would look cute and let's put it on the Instagram and this and this and this, all that stuff was awesome. And then like two weeks later, it didn't fit anymore. We, we buy her shoes. And then the next time I know it, I'm trying to fit her shoe inside. It doesn't, it doesn't fit in there. Because it, 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 it doesn't fit. We understand that babies outgrow really, really quickly. No matter how much we want to keep it, no matter how much we're like, man, I spent like 200 bucks on that shirt and it doesn't fit anymore. No matter how much we want to, they outgrow it. And as adults, we understand we also outgrow things. We outgrow things. We don't, me and you don't think like we used to think when we were in the fourth grade. Me and you can't even fit in clothes that we wore in the fourth grade. I'm pretty sure if I tried doing that, it would look like I was wearing a crop top with a beer belly. I don't know. (laughs) But we understand that we outgrow things. The problem is this, though, is although we are outgrowing things, the one thing we don't do sometimes is we don't get rid of the things that God is calling us to get rid of. See, when God saved you and when God took you out of where you were, he did so that you can have a new life in him. But I can't experience a new life if I'm still holding on to the old. I can't go and wear the new life that God is calling me to wear, and I can't do the things God's calling me to do if I am continuously trying to fit in what God called me to come out of. What God told me to get out of. See, church, we we like words like revival, and we like words like all these, but but can I tell you something? Revival doesn't happen until the people turn from their sins and go forward. Things don't change until we change. Your marriage doesn't change until someone in the room changes, which requires two people. Your life doesn't change until you begin to say no to the things that don't fit you anymore. There are places that don't fit you anymore. There are people that don't fit you anymore. There are things that you listen to that just don't fit you anymore. And that's okay. You have to be okay with letting it go. Because if what, what happens if we don't, what we do is we, like to, we, we, have to, we have to call a show called Hoarders, where you begin to hoard things because you can't let go of what was. Because it's been a part of your life for so long. You know what I'm talking about. Some of us, we have things from 1972 that we haven't let go in our garage. 
There are things that we hold on to because we're like, I just, I just, I want to keep it for my kids, grandkids, my gra- other, my generations after. Can I be honest with you? Those things that you want to keep, they're not going to care about in 20 years. But we got to keep it. And some of you in this room, the only way that you're able to move forward is by putting off, by letting go. And allowing God to do a new thing. Allowing God to show you what's better, what's greater. Allowing God to do, by, through the Holy Spirit to do such a work that, man, when people do come around you, they don't recognize you. They don't recognize by the way you talk. They don't recognize by the way you respond to things. You are not fit to be like culture. The Bible says we are in this world, but we are not of this world. So as a church, we're not trying to fit like our city wants us to fit like, like the culture wants to fit us like. We're not trying to fit like anybody else. We're trying to fit like the king created us to fit like. We're trying, we are created in the image of God, church, not in the image of man. Not in the image of the culture, not in the image of what the president might say. We are created in the image of God. The way God made you is with a purpose. He didn't make a mistake when he made you. So if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, we're going to be in verses 20 through 28. Ephesians 4, 20 through 28. says this. Paul says, that, however, is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus, you were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer but must work doing something useful with their own hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Notice, it, notice I want you to notice something this morning. As Paul is encouraging and he's challenging the Ephesian church, this is what he, he, he notice this. He talks about putting off more than putting on. He mentions it twice. You got to put off this. You got to put off this. And only one time he says you got to put it on. And could it be this, that in this moment, Paul is trying to address this issue, that although many people are knowing Jesus and being set free, there are still things lingering that they need to put off. There are things that they're still trying to hold on to that God is trying to cancel out. There are still people, there are still places, there are still habits that God is trying to set you free from. But if you keep holding on to it, God is not going to force himself. He's going to allow you to fall into it. And it's not his fault, it's ours. God does not create anything bad to happen to you. Things that are bad that happen to us, we allow to happen. We give room to it. Nobody wakes up and says, I want a divorce. Nobody wakes up and says, man, I just, I I love being sick. It's the best thing ever. It's so awesome. Nobody wakes up. Everything that is not of God comes from the enemy to try to destroy us. But we serve a God that comes and gives us life and life in abundance. So anything that comes from the enemy, it is our responsibility to reject. It is our decision. We have to decide to reject. There are people that are still trying to linger in your life that God is asking you to reject. Not because you're a jerk, not because you're a mean person, but because God has a greater purpose and those people are going to bring you down. Because God has done so much for you. And if you keep allowing the same circles to come, you'll keep living with the same cycles. 
And Jesus came to break every cycle in your life. Not so that you can encounter him one day and go back to your problems again and again and again and encounter him again. No, no. Jesus came to break it once and for all so that you can live the life God called you to live. So what are some things that Paul tells us to put off? Number one is this. The words you say. Paul says to put off the words you say. The words you say. He says it like this in verse 25. He says, therefore, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor. For we are all members of one body. It's important to understand something, church, that your words carry weight. Your words carry power. And the same words that built you up can be the same words that can tear you down. And the same words that you use to build people up can be the same words that you use to tear people down. And Paul is saying, if you're going to be like Christ, then your words matter. If you're going to be like Christ, then how you speak to others matter. He says, we're, he says, we're all one body. We live in a culture that's very divisive. We got elections coming on and it is very divisive. And everybody, either you choose this side or that side. Either you're with me or you're against me. And all these things. And the church is a church that's supposed to stand united. The Bible says that a house divided cannot stand. And if we're going to be a church that is united, then the words we speak have to be truth and not lies. It has to be life and not death. The Bible says that the power of life and death is in the tongue. So your words matter. And Paul is addressing the issue to these people. And he's telling me and you today that your words matter. If you've been speaking death over your family, if you've been speaking to your coworkers in such a way, I want to encourage you this morning to change your words. And many times, you know what it is, is that well, when we allow the lies of the enemy and the lies of experiences and the lies of all these things to take root in our heart, then what comes out is also lies. Because Jesus is the truth. And the Bible says that the truth will set you free. But if I'm allowing lies and all these junk to come into my life, then I'll never speak truth. Then I'll never allow the word of God to take root. Then I'll never be transformed. And my words will continue to be the same. I can't talk like I used to talk 10 years ago, 20 years ago. However old I am, I'm not going to tell you. I can't. I can't talk like that. I remember how I used to talk before Jesus. I remember the things I used to do, but I can't go back there anymore. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit my life anymore. Maybe you grew up in, in a household where there was a lot of abuse, verbal abuse, physical abuse, and that's all you knew. But can I encourage you with this? That when God comes into your life, it doesn't have to come with you. You can actually be the change in your family. Your, if your family wants to stay one way, you can say, you know what? As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. We will speak differently. We will love. We will forgive. We will say, we will confess, and we will speak life over our children. It starts with mom and dad. Things change when we change. But it is the words that me and you speak. And you might be in this room, you're like, you know, Pastor Sam, it's just, I, I don't get it right all the time. Okay. Get it right today and try every single day. Decide today to use your words to build up and not tear down. It doesn't take long for me and you to go online, social media, news, to see words that are, words are constantly tearing down people. We are constantly seeing people tear each other down. It doesn't take much. It doesn't take long. All it takes is me getting on my phone, and I can already see words.
being spoken over each other. I can already see division. I can already see death. I can already see that. So it doesn't take much to see that. It takes me and you deciding that, you know what, God, although everyone around me speaks one way, I speak life. And I speak the word of God. And that's what's going to come out of my mouth. Truth is going to come out of my mouth, not lies, not pain, not hurt. Amen? So we got to put off the words you say. And then you got to put off this, he says. You got to put off the anger that leads to sin. The anger that leads to sin. The Bible says it like this. The next verse in verse 26, it says, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. You have to, you have to understand something, church. Anger is not sin, but anger can lead to sin. Anger is not sin. It's, it's, it can lead to sin. And he's telling the people, you got to put off anger. There are things that make us angry all the time. There are things that make you angry sometimes. Whether it's your, your person that likes to be on time and when people make you late, it makes you angry. Or you're a person that's like, I don't know. Uh, I don't know. You're OCD. They didn't wipe the counter like I wanted to. You know, you, I don't know. And you get angry about that. But the Bible says, and Paul says this, in your anger, do not let it lead to sin. The Bible says in the beginning of Genesis that Cain and Abel, what happens? They are brothers, and God finds favor in one of them. And the other one gets angry and murders his brother. He gets angry because he's like, no, well, God rejected my offering and accepted his, so because I'm angry, I'm going to murder my brother. And although me and you in this room are not murdering each other out of anger, we do murder each other with our attitudes. We do kill off joy with our response, with our reactions. There are many moments in our life that are presented that either we are going to respond or react. We're going to react, we're going to get angry, and we're going to say a bunch of things with our mouth, and we're going to destroy somebody. Or we can either pause and respond and say, okay, this is what needs to be said. This is what needs to, how it needs to be handled. Because we can be a loose cannon when we're angry. That's including me. I can be a loose cannon when I'm angry. Whenever things don't go the way I want it to, whenever there are certain things that happen that I don't like, whenever the Cowboys play like they've been playing, you know, I get angry. Anyways, I'm about to confess all my anger to you about my favorite team. So I'm going to let it die. But the Bible says, he says, do not let your anger lead to sin. Some of you in this room, there are decisions that you have made out of anger that have led to sin. Some in this room, there are decisions that you have made out of anger that have destroyed other people. And God is asking you to reevaluate. God is asking you to think, th think it through. God's asking you to not go back to that. Not go back to your angry, anger ways, your angry ways. Not go back to doing things out of anger. He ends up saying this, and do not give the devil a foothold. The foothold is simply you giving the devil a, a, almost like a, a door cracking, an opportunity for the devil to come and mess with you. Anytime we give the devil an opportunity, he will take it. And like I've told you many times before, the devil's a defeated foe. That means he's under your feet. That means that he has no power over you. But he will, have, he will work in your life when you give him permission. That's why the Bible says in James 4, 7, he says it like this. It says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. 
But me and you will never be able to see the devil flee if we don't submit first. We love the part of man, I, yeah, the devil will flee from me. But the Bible says first to submit yourself to God. That means that every single day I have to submit my feelings. I have to submit my flesh. I have to submit myself to God first. That means I have to submit to the Lord. Just like you ask people when you're in a place of position of a boss or mom or dad in the room and you, your kids have to submit to you. It's the same thing with God. All of us in this room are called to submit to God. Where God is leader and I'm not. God is boss of my life and I'm not. And what God says, I do. The moment that I put myself above God is the moment chaos happens. The moment trouble happens. The moment all these other things start beginning to happen. You're like, man, why is this happening? Have you ever asked yourself, did I put myself above God? Have you ever asked yourself, did I listen to God or I listened to my flesh? What I thought should be done. What I felt in the moment was going to be right. Or did I go back and submit myself to God? Because when I do that, I allow myself to resist the devil and he flees. I can't resist the devil if I don't submit to God. Because outside of God... I want to do a lot of things when I'm angry. Outside of God, I want to do a lot of things when I'm hurt or whatever that I'm dealing with the moment. Outside of God, I can do a lot of things. I have free will to do whatever I want. It doesn't mean it's right. There's a famous saying, and it's very true. Just because you can doesn't mean you should. So when you come into this place and you submit to God, healing takes place. When you come to a place where you submit to God, forgiveness takes place. When you come into a place where you're submitting to God, wholeness takes place. Change takes place. All the things that we desire happens when we submit to God. And the Bible says in 1 John that Christ is quick to forgive, church. We serve a God that will empower me and you as we submit to him and resist. We will, see, we will see the devil flee. Some of you, the devil will flee today. The devil doesn't have power. He doesn't have to be anywhere near you because we serve a God that's far greater than that. I'm not looking at abusers and I'm not looking at addicts. I'm looking at people that are free, set free by the power of God, set free by your spirit. But it starts with submitting to him. And lastly, is we gotta, if we're gonna put it off, we gotta take, stop taking shortcuts. The Bible says this in verse 27 and 28. It says, and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may some have something to share with those in need. Church, what is stealing? And this is stealing. It's taking something someone else earned. It's a shortcut. Stealing is taking something else that someone else earned. And we call those things shortcuts. It's not just you're physically robbing money from a bank, but you're also robbing things from people. You're robbing in relationships, robbing in friendships. You're robbing, you're, you're taking shortcuts in your businesses. You're taking shortcuts with people. Anything that is causing you to rob somebody from something is stealing. And, and Paul's saying, steal no more and work with your hands. For some, some people in the room, it is still no more. If it's robbing, rob no more. But if you're robbing people of joy, if you're robbing people of peace, if you're robbing people of all these things, it's the same thing. Put your hands to work. In other words, change the way you live. Let your actions reflect Christ. Because at the end of the day, me and you are called to reflect Jesus not reflect anybody else. 
Because when you encountered Christ, Christ transforms you. When you encounter Christ, you have no desire for nothing else but him, but to please him. You have no desires for the old things in life. When you encounter Christ, change happens. When the Holy Spirit takes a hold of you, you can't be the same person. And you can walk differently. And you can think different. And you can do things the way God designed it for you to do. But it starts with you understanding that, man, I can't take shortcuts. But what I can do is make sure that my actions are reflecting Christ. That my actions are doing something that aligns with the word of God. That I don't have to be and and act a certain way. If Jesus wants me this way, then I'm going to do it that way. If God is asking me to forgive, then I'm going to forgive, even though everything tells me I shouldn't forgive. They don't deserve my forgiveness. Can I be honest with you? You don't deserve Christ's forgiveness either, but he does it anyways. He forgives you anyways. He got on that cross and died so that you could be forgiven and set free. So you could have salvation. None of us in the room deserved it. We didn't do anything to earn it. He did it freely. Because he loves us that much. He loves you that much. All it takes is you encountering Christ. All it takes is you deciding today to reflect Christ. That's why Paul said it like this. About to land this plane. He said this in verse, uh, where is it? Verse 20, I'm going to go back to verse 20. He said, how is not the way of life you learn when you heard about Christ and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deep, deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Created to be like God. Not like Pastor Sam, like God. That me and you were created to be like God. If I'm created to be like God, then things got to go. If I'm created to be like God, instead of using my words to destroy, I actually build people up. I put on a new mouth, a new tongue. So when the Holy Spirit comes, it gives you a new way. Some of you, instead of speaking French when you're angry, speak in tongues. Some of us, we have an A in French. If we're going to put on anything if, in our anger, then we should put on forgiveness and allow reconciliation to happen. Let me be reconciled to the people that I'm hurting and vice versa. Maybe something, if someone did something to you and they've been trying to get your forgiveness for years. Can I be honest with you? Forgive them. Forgive them. Forgiveness is very, a very touchy subject because forgiveness, when we think of forgiveness, we think of pain. We think of hurt. We think of man, it's because she said this or he did this and it affected this part of me. And although those things are real, it doesn't have to stay in your life forever. God can set you free from that. God didn't create you to be depressed all your life or be anxious. He created you to have joy. We're supposed, we're supposed to be the most joyful people on the planet. Amen? Yeah, someone clap like, yeah, it's about time someone laughed a little bit. We're supposed to be that. Most joyful people. But I can't be joyful if I'm holding on with something that doesn't fit 
Unforgiveness doesn't fit you anymore. Resentment doesn't fit you anymore. Shame doesn't fit you anymore. You gotta put it, you gotta put on forgiveness. You gotta reconcile. You gotta allow God to renew your mind. The Bible says to renew our mind. Because whatever starts in our mind gets into our heart and then comes out of our mouth. But the Bible says to not conform, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In Romans 12, 2, the renewing of your mind. Y'all can stand in this moment. Church, transformation happens when we turn away from our old life, from our sins. Transformation happens. You want peace in your home. It requires you to turn away from something. You want peace for yourself and you don't want to carry anxiety. It requires you to turn away from something. It requires you to turn away. And when you do, you will experience the power of God like never before. That's why it's crazy. Paul's talking to the Ephesian church in this moment, telling them to put off and put on. And it's the same thing that happens in Acts chapter 19 when the power of God comes. The Bible says it like this in Acts 19. You can put it real quick. Verse 13. This is when some Jews were trying to copy Paul and they, they couldn't. But I, wa I want you to see something. The Bible says that some Jews who went around driving out evil spirits tried to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon possessed. They would say, in the name of the Jesus whom Paul preaches, I command you to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, Jewish chief priest, were doing this. One day, the Holy Spirit answered him, answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I know about, but who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered them all. He gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. When this became known to the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were all seized with fear and the name of the Lord Jesus was held in high honor. Many of those who believed now came and openly confessed what they had done. A number who had practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. When they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. Bible says, from one place, we see the seven sons of Sceva, they get their butts kicked by a demon. But from that place, it turns into, now people are believing God, that there's a true God out there. And when they realize that the true God is available, and he is present, and he is real, they themselves start feeling the conviction. And they themselves start burning their books and their sorcery and all these things because they recognize who the true God was. Who there is one true God. You don't got to burn sage, put an egg under your bed or whatever stupid thing they do out there. All that witchcraft isn't going to do anything. It has no power. We serve a God that's all powerful. All powerful. I bring this up because that same all powerful God is present today. He is present today to set you free. He's present today to empower you to put off the old self and to put on the new. He's present today to allow you, to give you the strength, the wisdom, the right words that you need to let go of the thing that you've outgrown. The thing that doesn't fit in your life anymore. For some of you, it's walking away from something that you don't want to walk away from. For others, it's cutting a habit that you don't want to let go of. But whatever it is that is tr you are trying to fit in your life, 
I implore you today to let it go so that the power of God can come in and set you free and heal your mind and your heart and your body and heal your family and make a breakthrough in your life so that you can have a testimony from your, for yourself. I can't hold on to grief and try to worship God. I can't hold, hold on to past pains and try to worship God. Jesus didn't die so that I could hold on to my old life. He died so that I could be set free. He didn't get on that cross so that I can come in every Sunday morning, worship him a little bit, and go back home and still live the same life. He died so that you can be changed, church. He didn't die so you could be sorry, so that you could be changed. And only God can do that. Thank you so much for joining our service and for listening to us. We are located at 4519 East Del Mar Boulevard in Laredo, Texas. And we hope that you continue to be a part of our ICM family.